Good evening and welcome to this public lecture of the 2017 conference Religion, Society and the Science of Life, sponsored by the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion and the International Society for Science and Religion here at St Anne's College in Oxford University. Our speaker this evening is Professor Alison McGrath. Alison McGrath is the Andreas Idrios Professor of Science and Religion here at the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Oxford and is a Professor of Divinity at Gresham College. Professor McGrath holds three doctorates from the University of Oxford, a DPhil in Molecular Biophysics, a Doctorate on Divinity of, in Theology, and a doc he's also a Doctor of Letters in Intellectual History. He was previously Professor of Theology, Ministry and Education at King's College London, and Head of the Centre for Theology, Religion and Culture, Professor of Historical Theology at the University of Oxford, and was principal of Wycliffe Hall, Oxford, until 2005. He's ordained in the Anglican ministry, and his works are named on all the key syllabi for religious studies in all the schools in the United Kingdom. Professor McGrath is noted for his work in historical theology, systematic theology, and the relationship between science and religion, as well as his writings on apologetics. He's also known for his opposition to new atheism and anti-religionism, and his advocacy of theological critical realism. Among his best-known books are The Twilight of Atheism, The Dawkins Delusion, Dawkins' God, Genes, Memes, and the Meaning of Life, and A Scientific Theology. His recent biography of C.S. Lewis has also attracted much critical acclaim. His most recent book, launched just the 6th of May, is The Great Mystery, God, science, and the human quest for meaning. I'd like to add three personal reflections to this official list of achievements. So I've been a research director at the Ian Ramsey Center for eight years now, um, and we were doing quite a lot of things until 2015 when Alistair McGrath arrived. And it was like having um, the Saturn V rocket booster placed <laughs> under the Ian Ramsey Center, right? And um, it's been a very uh, exciting time uh, ever since. Uh, a second observation, I work hard in my own job, but I never feel I work harder than my boss. So uh, I think you aim to publish about one book a year and four papers a year, and, and a whole huge range of other activities. But a comment also about uh, Alistair's writing style, because he's gone into that happy land beyond the obscure. So academics, they start writing simply, then they then they become more and more obscure and difficult to read. But they, you know, a few of them pass into this little golden upland where, once again, they're straightforward to read, but with huge depth um, behind, um, behind the breadth. And he's, his books are easy to read and yet communicate um, great wisdom as well. But I'll add one other comment. His books are often seasoned with a kind of gentle deflationary humour, and that's excellent for killing dragons. So would you please welcome Alison McGrath. Well, thank you, Andrew, and uh, it's a great delight to be able to speak to you. And I want to just reflect with you on some themes on science and religion. It's a very general overview, and in many ways, one of the questions I'm asking is this. How do we excite a new generation about science and religion? I think there are some opening questions we might just begin by looking at, and one of them is very simply this, and that is whether science and religion really is a research field at all, or whether it's just a convenient gathering together of interesting topics. And it seems to me that um, you know, there is this, this interest in these fields, although of course there are many difficulties in actually defining what it means. And of course the difficulty is that there are multiple sciences, each with their own distinct methodologies, and, of course, there are different religious traditions, which, of course, cannot possibly be regarded simply as having a, a single take on reality. And so I think we have to ask the question as to whether there's simply a pragmatic designation of an interesting area of study um, and realise that actually the words science and religion have referred to different things at different times. But nevertheless, we still have a pretty good sense of what this discussion is all about. But I think there are some issues here, and perhaps I could use this analogy of a chessboard, if you'd just like to hold that image in your mind. I mean, if you think of the field of science and religion and think of all the possible squares there might be, so to speak, 
I mean, what you find is that some of these squares are, um, are certainly there. You know, for example, the relationship between Hinduism and evolutionary biology. But the problem is, I think, that some of these are very well studied and others are not. So, in effect, science and religion designates a broad range of possibilities, but there are certain areas that are very well studied and others that are not. And I would single out a number of areas of intense activity, unsurprisingly, the whole relation of science and religion in Western Europe, the relation of natural science and Christian theology, or indeed the philosophy of religion, and of course this burgeoning interest in the cognitive science of religion, which I hope will lead to a sort of um, review of some of its ideas uh, as time goes on. Um, but of course there are other areas where we find really little in the way of um, activity. So in many ways what I want to do in this lecture is ask why might we engage with this field. And I'm going to suggest there are three reasons that we might do so, and then suggest that perhaps we need also to think about others as well. And so in many ways these are very predictable, very standard responses. First of all, it really is interesting. I think that's always a good start. Secondly, that whether we like it or not, science and religion are very significant cultural stakeholders, and therefore getting any significant elements in culture to talk to each other is potentially quite a good idea. And of course, many of us would say that interdisciplinary work is rewarding, Although, of course, there are obvious risks. The main risk being that somebody who looks at the relationship between A and B sometimes doesn't know very much about A or B, and hence is generally ignored by those in the fields of A and those in the fields of B. So we have a risk to run there. But what I want to suggest tonight is that actually we need perhaps to think about other areas as well. One of the concerns I want to talk about is the whole issue of knowledge transfer. By which I mean, how do we, in effect, ensure that research, reflection on research, is finding its way into the public sphere? And perhaps I could just mention tonight very briefly a new series that we hope will begin to publish next year. And that is the Ian Ramsey Centre series in science and religion. We've thought about this for a long time. It is something that we think is necessary. As you will see in a moment, this is a very Oxford project. But I want to emphasise that it's not actually limited to Oxford at all. It's a link between the Ian Ramsey Centre and Oxford University Press. And in effect, it is anchored to the Ian Ramsey Centre, irrespective of whether I stay here or not. It's nothing to do with me as a person. And what we hope to do is produce nine volumes over the next uh, five or six years. The reason I'm mentioning this is simply to say we want to do something about the obvious need to produce research and dissemination of information in this area. And one of the points I simply want to make tonight is that this is something that some of you here tonight might be interested in contributing to. Although it is a very Oxford project, in Ramsey Centre, Oxford University, Oxford University Press, it is not limited to Oxford. And we are looking for the best to be able to put in this series aiming to make an impact on the discussion of science and religion. So that's all very predictable. What I want to suggest now is that there are straws in the wind that make me think we're missing out on something, that there might be other things we could be doing that might actually ensure that this field of science of religion is taken very seriously by a younger generation. So here are three straws in the wind. Uh, three of them, which you are actually in your programme. Now I'm going to add a fourth, which uh, isn't on your programme. First of all, to our surprise, um, science and religion is going to be the most popular specialist subject studied by Oxford undergraduates in theology from next academic year onwards. This took us by surprise. Uh, it's a very nice surprise. We're just wondering how we're going to teach this. Um, but um, it, it is very significant because there are 11 possible special subjects and they include things like the history of the 19th century, um, theological debates, which are really very interesting. So what's that saying? I, I, I'd say nothing, but here's something else. Another straw in the wind, if you like. That Oxford University's Master of Studies in 
science and religion, which is a specialist uh, theological qualification, is actually the largest such specialist um, master's degree in the Faculty of Theology. Now again, why? Is that saying anything? And here's something else that we gave uh, an Ian Ramsey Center lecture here at Oxford not that long ago, uh, and we attracted an audience of 570, and the Facebook page suggested a lot more thinking about coming. Mostly undergraduates. We'd never seen them before. I mean, what is going on here? Now, as I said, these are three straws in the wind. Some of you say, well, you know, this is Oxford. Oxford does strange things, so we, we can't really read too much into this. And as I was thinking about this um, late last week, thinking I, I, I'm going to get a fourth straw in the wind to make this slightly more plausible, um, an email popped up on my screen. Uh, and here it is. This is what this is all about. This is um, Russell Brand, who <laughs> those of you who are Brits will know all about a kind of the, the guy who really is energizing 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, who sent me an email saying, I'd like you to come and talk on my blog, you have an R, about this science and religion thing. And so we did that on Tuesday, and uh, his basic take is this. Okay, this is Russell Brand speaking, not me. In dialogue with me, yes, but his insight, basically the science on its own, is not good enough to meet the needs of this rising generation. They want to talk about meaning and hope, and they don't see that in science. Now, that's a fourth straw in the wind. In fact, I would say that's a, a kind of bale of straws in many ways, <laughs> given this guy's a very significant reach into that culture. What is this saying? I'm going to suggest to you three possible explanations. There may be others. I'm going to accentuate one of them which I think is particularly important. And I think, basically, that there are three things we might tease out, three anxieties, three feelings that maybe things need to be developed. First of all, there is a real anxiety about what we might call intellectual tunnel vision through ex excessive specialisation in a single, narrow field of study, the wasteland of experts, if you want to use a phrase. Secondly, maybe there's a misplaced emphasis on knowledge and information without any sense that this leads to the acquisition of wisdom, which is not the same as knowledge. And then thirdly, and my feeling is this third one is the really interesting one, because this is what Russell Brandt picked up on, a general failure within the scientific community to engage deep existential questions about meaning, purpose, and value. And those questions are re-emerging. If you live in a society and you feel the society has lost its way, you as an individual are going to start asking these questions. So let's just begin to look at these and see where they might take us. This is from Edward Wilson's book, Consilience. Um, it's one of his better books in my view. And this is one of the remarks he makes towards the end, where in effect he is saying, look, people need to talk to each other, science and religion do, even though he didn't like religion very much. He felt there was a conversation that needed to happen. Look at the phraseology. We are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. The world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people who are able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it, and make important choices wisely. In other words, not necessarily interdisciplinarity, but rather being able to reach out beyond a very narrow disciplinary specificity. Then we might think of a phrase that many of you will know. It becomes popular in the 19th century, the so-called Renaissance man. What's interesting, though, is that this nowadays is taken to mean simply a polymath, but actually, really, this, this, this word took off in the Victorian age. It's one of those phrases that we think goes back to the Renaissance, but actually, it's really the Victorians reflecting on the Renaissance and seeing in it something they felt was beginning to disappear from their own culture. And basically the concern, here at Oxford in the 19th century, 
in London in the 19th century is that the kind of cultural unity was beginning to fragment into disciplines which did not talk to each other. And the idea of the Renaissance man is postulated as somebody who's able to hold things together while, in effect, fragmentation is happening around us. In other words, there is this aspiration, this longing for some kind of cultural unity, whereas, in fact, people are beginning to fragment into specific disciplinary areas. And there's a sort of feeling that we need people who refuse to be isolated and are able to um, engage culture, maybe with the strength of a single discipline, but preferably with the strength of many. So maybe that's something we need to think about. Maybe we could present science and religion as offering this more integrated picture, this bigger way of seeing things, which resists this cultural trend towards fragmentation. Here's a second theme, knowledge versus wisdom. It's very easy to make that comparison, rather more difficult to actually define what's meant by it. Again, there's Wilson's quote, we are drowning information while starving for wisdom. And clearly, wisdom is, whatever it is, more than simply an accumulation of information. And in some way, we want to try and draw a distinction between the acquisition of technical competence and the broader picture of becoming wise and humane. Uh, in the German tradition, maybe the distinction between Wissenschaft and Bildung, but the same basic distinction is there in English as well. And we might say that wisdom involves perhaps an integration rather than accumulation of knowledge, experience and deep understanding that incorporates tolerance for the uncertainties of life as well as helping us to cope with difficulties and crises. Now again, I think this way of thinking about the relationship between science and religion has potential. And that's why I think it's very interesting to look at some recent discussions of this, again, just to tease out a few themes and not to do anything very much with them in this lecture. This is Sharon Ryan's idea of a deep rationality. Wisdom is, in effect, an ability to see a deeper understanding of our world, rather than limit yourself to the rationality distinctive of any particular tradition. So that's one way of looking at it. that. I have to say it has been criticised, but you can see the breadth of the vision that she's casting. Or again, we might go to um, positive psychology, to Martin Seligman's, for example, way of describing wisdom as a character strength. Um, wisdom is not a, the same as knowledge or intelligence. Rather, it's a higher form of knowledge that allows us to see things through a wider lens. That kind of language actually is helpful. It does allow you to see perhaps science and religion as offering you this, this bigger picture, this way of looking at things, which I think might give you this deeper and richer way of looking at our world, but also, of course, of inhabiting it as well. So clearly there's some thoughts there that might be helpful. And I flagged up these two themes because I think they are there, I think they are both interesting, but my money is on the third of these, and it's this. The need to reintegrate discussions about meaning, purpose, and value into our thinking. And it seems to me that there's a real possibility of, in fact, science and religion giving us together a richer way of understanding which values technical competence, which values an understanding of how things work, but wants to supplement this with an understanding of how, well, what things mean, what we mean, and reintroducing that deeper existential concern into these things. This is Alex Rosenberg's book, and The Atheist Guide to Reality. And some of you will know this book, and I'm just going to flag up what I think is a problem, because it seems to me this helps us understand maybe some of the questions we might want to engage. And as you know, in the opening chapter of this, he briefly looks at a number of questions, posing them, and giving his own distinct answer as 
a scientist. And these are perhaps a little bit predictable, but they are brief and to the point. Is there a God? No. What's the nature of reality? What physics says it is, which is great for a physicist, uh, tough thing for something else. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. Again, what is the meaning of life? Ditto. This is, I think, where many of you will want to take a deep breath and think about this. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. When I first read that, I thought I had misread it. In fact, I thought, I thought actually it said, science is unable to tell us that there is any moral difference between them. But actually the statement is stronger than that. And looking at these answers, especially that last one, that seems to me to really open up this question of where we get ideas about meaning, purpose, and value from. Because if the psychologists are right, and in effect we need, as human beings, some system of meaning to in effect direct us and stabilize us, the difficulty is that psychology may help us identify this need but it doesn't help us to answer the question of what that meaning might be. It can help us, I think, decide what sort of things we find meaningful, but that's not quite the same as saying this is what the meaning is or ought to be. So Rosenberg himself, I think, is quite clear that <coughs> there are some difficulties in this position. I think the most significant of these is it's rather circular, in other words, he has to almost presuppose what he wants to prove. But nevertheless, I think you can see that this indicates that there is perhaps space to talk about these major issues. <coughs> and if Rosenberg is right, and science is simply unable to answer these questions, or at least to give answers that some would find satisfactory, then the question is, where are these things going to come from? So I want to run with this for a while. And um, my concern, really, is a dismissive elimination of meaning, purpose, and value, when the evidence is suggesting that a younger generation finds these things increasingly significant, and if they do not find them in their governments and their social structures, then they will create them for themselves. Which is why it seems to me that this interaction of science and religion could really be quite interesting. This is Jeanette Winterson, a um, wonderfully titled book, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. I'd buy that. In fact, I think I did buy it, which is why I got this quotation. But you'll notice that what she says in this book is really interesting. We cannot simply eat, sleep, hunt, and reproduce. We are meaning-seeking creatures. And that is her starting point. That is, in order to understand who we are as human beings, we need to face up to this and take that question with ultimate seriousness. <coughs> she isn't entirely confident we can answer it, but nevertheless, it's on the table. And as far as she's concerned, it really does matter. So this is from uh, Michael Steger's article, um, Meaning in Life. And he's just reflecting on his perceptions, in this case as a psychologist, as to what this thing, meaning, is all about. Meaning's about the extent to which people comprehend, make sense of, or see significance in their lives, accompanied by the degree to which they perceive themselves to have a purpose, mission, or overarching aim in life. And again, the point I'm making is if people feel that their society is not giving them this, they are going to look for it somewhere else because this is important to them. And that seems to me to be an important point to make. Now, one of the issues for me is that philosophy on the whole hasn't engaged this with quite the seriousness we might have expected. I'm sure this will be remedied. But Susan Wolfe, for example, in her book, The Meaning of Lives, is rather, <coughs> rather concerned that her own discipline seems to have not engaged with this quite as effectively as she would have liked. She writes that the meaning of life is hardly ever discussed in philosophical circles nowadays, and then she writes, only by naive young students whose lack of sophistication 
cause professional philosophers to cringe with embarrassment. Her words. Notice the word young students. In other words, these are the people who think these things are important. Now, of course, maybe you know, 40 years down the line, they won't see it this way anymore. But clearly, for this generation, there is something here that is significant. <clears throat> she talks, for example, about uh, life having any meaning being banished from philosophy, perhaps an overstatement, but nevertheless, something I think we do need to take seriously. And I reference here her book, Meaning in Life, which I think is really interesting. She then makes the point that actually religion remains one of the most important sources of meaning and value in our culture. <coughs> and her point is that as human beings, we need something that's going to hold together our minds and our hearts, our reason and experience, and not just restrict us to a rather dull world of a rationalism or something like that. So it seems to me this is something that's interesting. So we might just linger and ask, what does that word meaning designate? What sort of areas does it cover? And we might, I think, single out a number. I think there are four recurrent themes in the research literature. I hear I draw Mackenzie and Barmaster. And, you know, questions of who am I? Why am I here? Can I make a difference? Do I matter? And these are important questions, but maybe they're not empirical questions. They're pitched at a different level. These are interpretative. <clears throat> these are existential questions. They're pitched at a different level. You can't read this off from nature. It involves interpretation. And certainly I think you can see these questions actually keep bubbling up for people as they reflect on who they are, what they're meant to be doing, and again, it seems to me these really do need to be engaged. What difference do they make? Well, let's draw on Nietzsche. And I've, I just kept this in German because there's so many of you here tonight who do speak German. I'll just um, give you the English translation. <coughs> and a rough English translation of Nietzsche's um, rather nice aphorism from Goetz and Dämon is, if you have a, if you have a why, then you can cope about with just about any how. If you have a why, you can cope with just about any how. In other words, he's saying if you can make sense of what is happening to you, that helps you to cope with it. And of course, there are many who read Nietzsche and in effect almost made that into a kind of leading theme of their thinking. And that seems to me to be a very important point to make. But I think one of the writers who addresses this best is a Spanish writer, which is Jose Ortega. And again, he argues, again, there's so many Spanish-speaking people here tonight that I just leave it on the screen. Um, his argument is that um, scientific truth is characterized by its exactness and the rigor of its analysis, but these admirable qualities are won at the cost of, in effect, remaining on the level of secondary issues without engaging ultimate, decisive questions. In other words, it's, it's a descriptive level. It's not about this deep existential engagement, which is what people seem to want. I'm not entirely clear whether he's presenting this as a philosophical conclusion or an empirical observation, but nevertheless, I think it is quite a significant point to make. In effect, the issue really is that we need some kind of big picture, which positions science, which positions faith, which positions ourselves, and gives us that sense of significance, identity, and so on. And if we don't have that big picture, then in effect we feel we are, we are not living fully and meaningfully as human beings. And writers like Crystal Park have tried to draw out the idea that you can make a distinction, perhaps, between a global system of meaning and then, if you like, a sort of situational meaning where, in effect, this is how this big picture is actualized in a particular context. In other words, a big picture which then focuses in on this situation and helps you figure out what is going on, what you could be doing, in that particular situation. 
And the key point here is this need for this bigger picture. And again, one of the questions is whether science is able to deliver quite what you're looking for there. So back to um, uh, the point that she, Crystal Park's making. In effect, um, she's arguing that we use a, an overarching global framework of beliefs, goals, and sense of purposes, and we use this to assign meanings to specific experiences, in other words, to determine situational meaning. So this idea, I think, of a big picture really is quite important. It frames our experiences and helps us to work out what they mean. So again, the emphasis is this global picture, this big picture, or again, if we go back to Ortega, again, he's arguing that um, it's simply impossible for human beings, um, <coughs> even through the application of psychological force, to get rid of this, this fundamental idea of a, a complete account of the world or an integral idea of the universe, a big picture. It's almost built into us. And he's saying you just cannot get away from this, and this is what gives animation and direction to life. So I've talked about this third point at much more uh, length than the others. And the reason is, it seems to me, it helps us to frame the science-religion dialogue or debate in terms of the recognition of the importance of science and the welcoming of science, while at the same time the noting of its seeming inadequacies in this area of existential traction. And that's not a criticism of science at all. It's respecting the distinct identity of science and just saying we seem to need more than that if we're going to function as human beings. And the reason I'm stressing this point so much is that we could supplement the more academic motivations for studying science and religion that I mentioned earlier, in effect by saying this is in effect about engaging the deep questions of life. In other words, it is dealing with questions people are really asking. And that seems to me to give this whole area both a relevance and a specificity which otherwise might not be there. So let me go now to Albert Einstein. Um, Einstein, as you all know, um, basically developed the idea of the world line based on uh, Minkowski's Algebra of Space and Time. And basically saw past, present, and future as being interconnected, and saw the world line as a curve connecting a series of points in space-time, which represents the history of a particle or an observer. And the reason I'm just telling you about this is because I'm going to be asking you whether this distinction between a past in which we were not present, a present when we are here, and a future when we will no longer be here is quite as detached and objective as Einstein seems to be suggesting. And so what we will do is, if we may, uh, just ask whether Einstein's account is existentially adequate. It may be scientifically correct, but the issue is, do you and I need more than that? And does the more than that contradict what he is saying. And the question will ever be a purely chronological spatial account of identity, is that good enough? And to help you think about this, I'm going to quote from a letter Einstein wrote um, to the family of um, Michael Lebeso, who was a physicist and a lifelong friend of Einstein, who died in March 1955. And this is an extract from the letter of condolence to I, uh, Besso's family. Again, I kept from German. Some of you read German, but I'll give you a translation as we go along. Here it is. Um, it, this is a letter of condolence. Okay. Um, he's talking about Besso. Now, um, he's departed from this strange world a bit before me. This means nothing for us believing physics, physicists. The distinction between the past, the present, and the future has no significance other than that of a persistent illusion. 
And I often wonder, you know, how Bessel's family reacted to that. <laughs> because, yes, you know, there's past, present, future, but <laughs> this man has died. And, and the issue is that this physical description of the situation just seems to fail to do justice to what is actually going on. And many of you will know that um, um, Einstein befriended Carnap in the 1940s, so both at Princeton, and Carnap discussed this whole question in detail of Einstein. And this is, according to Carnap, the, the conclusion that Einstein reached. Einstein believed that scientific descriptions cannot possibly satisfy our human needs. The human quest for meaning simply couldn't be met through physics. And for Carnap, at least as he summarized Einstein, there were significant existential concerns, such as the concept of the now, in other words, we're here now, once in the past, won't be in the future, which lay tantalizing, look at this phrase, just outside the realm of science. Now that seems to me to open up lots of possibilities. And so what I'm doing really is just reflecting with you on where we might go. One of the points I've been emphasizing is that there are very good academic reasons for thinking about this relationship between science and faith. But there is a sense in which these are the, the reasons of the professional guild. Might there be something deeper which might resonate with our culture, especially with younger people within it. And that's why I think these thoughts might help us to, um, in effect, think about science and religion as a field, as offering us a way of thinking about explanation and meaning in a culture which rightly values science but feels it needs more. It can, this is a framework for exploring how our development and understanding of the world correlates with this deep human quest for meaning, value, and purpose. And, you know, again, there might be a motivation for this engagement, which might be existential, not simply intellectual. And I'm not in any way denigrating the intellectual side of things at all. I'm holding on to that. I'm just saying there is something else, and maybe we need to make sure that that feeds into our thinking as well. So this line of reflection, I mean, if it has any merit, seems to me to lead to two areas in particular, which might be significant grounds for developing interest in this field. And as I talk about this, many of you will say, actually, this is true, but it's also already happening. So the two areas I've singled out are schools. And many of you here tonight will, will, will want to say there is such interest amongst 16 to 18 year olds about the field of science and religion. I mean, you know, you go to school and give a lecture on it, they turn up, they're interested, they're engaged. Maybe that's something to think about something that could be developed. And then, of course, churches and other religious institutions where questions of meaning and value are deemed to be important. Now, those, therefore, seem to me to be areas outside the academy, as we traditionally understand that, but nonetheless, which we are well able to engage. And that seems to me to help us just think about the future of this field of science of religion, in effect as the, the area where we can open up these deep questions, looking at them from two quite distinct, but I would argue potentially complementary angles. So basically, what I'm suggesting in this lecture is that we maintain a traditional emphasis on the academic merits of the field of science of religion. And my own immersion in the field excites me, and I know there is more that can be done. And nothing I'm saying in this lecture detracts from that. It's there. But there's something else I think we're missing out on. And in many ways, this lecture is just saying maybe we need to also emphasize the capacity of our field 
to open up deep existential questions which clearly have cultural traction within Western culture as well as personal importance for individuals. Am I right? I don't know. But why don't you listen to that hour-long conversation with Russell Brand when it is published shortly? I think two things will happen. Your opinion of me personally will go right down because uh, I, I'm afraid I, I use some words and um, I behave in certain ways that you might think were not quite appropriate. Uh, but that, that's because I'm talking to Russell Brand. But I think much more importantly, you will see in that conversation a clear indication of the importance of these questions of meaning, value and hope and this almost sense of desperation that there doesn't seem to be any cultural authority in our nation, including science, that is able to deliver on this. So my feeling is we ought to explore this as well as our traditional emphasis on the academic side of things. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to me this evening.